Content warning. This episode includes discussion of depression, suicidal thoughts, and suicide. Hey, listeners. I'm Erica. And I'm Sean. We are co-owners of Code One Barbecue in Wilmington, Massachusetts, and we're here at WCTV on location recording through Fire and Oak, a podcast about what it's like to run a small business, manage a family, and get through life every day. I like that one. Hello and welcome back, listeners, to Through Fire and Oak. This is episode four with Erica and Sean. Hello. 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 And we're excited to be here. Thank you, WCTV, for hosting us and producing this podcast. So what are we going to talk about today, Sean? Mental health. Whoa. Whoa. That's a deep subject. It is. Did you bring Oprah? I didn't. Dr. Phil. should have. I, I prefer Mel Robbins, but hey. <laughs> you gotta up you you know, you gotta get with the times, man. It would have been much cooler if we brought Dr. Phil and what was that other <laughs> girl's name? He made famous. I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever. We'll get through it, we'll get through it. So we've been through three episodes so far. Yep. And we've been through almost sixteen months in the restaurant, over Good. three years in business. Yeah, just about. Yeah, because we, right around this time, actually three years was 2021, so that would have been three years ago. We were already, you know, regularly smoking and sharing food from the backyard yeah. illegally uh, well, on donation. On donations. <laughs> and trying to figure out how to start the business. Yep. And uh, you were feeling, you know, pretty good. You were like, I want to do this for a living. This is awesome. Yep. All right, let's fast forward. Here we are. I still want to do it for a living. <laughs> <laughs> you sure about that? I still do not want to go work for somebody else. So why? Why? Well, I just, you know, making other people, you know, it, it's just weird. It's, you know, it's, it's for some people and not for others. I mean, there's obviously nothing wrong with working for anybody else. 100%. Like, they're, you know, 99% of everybody that... I mean, we need employees, working. so we yeah. need ple- people to work for yeah, us. Yeah, exactly. But for me, it was just I was at the point where I was extremely burnt out at work, you know, making other people money, getting paid. I was getting paid pretty well, right? Yeah, but, I remember. <laughs> but Because it, it enabled me to stay home and run my own business yeah. and, you know, go to the park with the kids in the afternoons and stuff. But it was... uh you know, at the end of the week, it, it wasn't, I was building, you know, someone else's brand. Would and you say you were not fulfilled? Yeah. You know, I was, it was the same week after week, excuse me, cha- you know, chasing technicians and chasing other people's money and, you know, making phone calls that I didn't want to make and working with, you know, a whole multitude of different people. It was just, I was done with it. You know, if I was going to do that, I might as well do it for myself, right? So I can 100% attest to that because I, I asked you this recently and I said, do you remember when I was working in corporate America many years ago? So I've been out of the corporate scene for quite some time now. Yep. You said, no, I don't remember this. <laughs> and I said, um, I just had one moment where we had had our second child my mother was very sick. She was yep. dying of cancer. Yep. I was taking care of her, and I was working full time much of that from home for you know a corporate financial institution. Right. And uh, I literally remember sitting down in a rocking chair one day with you and just bawling my eyes out and saying like, "This is not a life worth living, and I can't do this anymore." Yeah. And you were working full time, and you know, as a manager in the HVAC field, and you know helping run a company, and you had said, you need to quit. That's it. We'll figure it out. We'll budget it. You need to quit. And I went in, and I gave my notice. Yep. That feels like a lifetime ago to me. It was a long time ago. But for you, it was just a year and a half ago, or yep. two years ago. Two years. Yep. And so when it came time for you to do that. But it was pretty easy because we had just come out of COVID. Like, I wasn't around anybody really right and then you know swinging in out of covid we were at work but weren't at work it was, I don't know, it was just so weird it was yeah it the was, idea of going back into the office for you was like torture i was like oh 
and I remember that feeling. And you know what it too is it's like driving I was driving into traffic to work and driving home in traffic to work. Yeah. And that was like the last three jobs, right? Every time I moved, I made more money and I got a better position. But I just got more and more deeper into traffic. <laughs> so I had to stay I had to go in early to beat the traffic going in and then I had to stay late to beat the traffic going home or I had to leave wicked early, right? I suddenly had to have an appointment. You know, I would make appointments closer to home. Right, so that you time. can but towards but, the towards the end of my career I, I was in charge of just about, you know, a couple of different areas. So I couldn't do that. I couldn't leave early. I couldn't you know, when I was a salesman, I'd be like, okay, uh, my next appointment is going to be in Wakefield. Yep. <laughs> I got to make, and I would call all my clients I had to go see. And I would schedule the last one closer to home so I could be home at dinner time. Towards the end, it was like, I'll see you at seven. Yeah. You know? You were being pulled into a lot of meetings. Yeah. You were on the phone all the time. All the time. You were getting phone calls at, you know, 5 a.m. Yep. Every day, never fail. Never fail. You weren't sleeping at night. Nope. Which isn't much different from now. Except that there's no, not a lot of phone calls. Right. Because I, I, I get all the phone you calls. You get all the phone calls yeah. now. I just have to deal with all the meet people. Right. So when it came time when you said, like, I could just do this for a living, I remember saying, like, it, it's your turn. Let's just go for it. And, you you know, you went in and gave your notice and you were all excited. Yep. And I'd already been through this. I worked for somebody else my whole life, straight out of high school, you know, I mean, I went to college for a little while and I left, I, you know, got my degree later, I went to culinary school later, but I had always had a job working for other people. So I kind of knew when you were ready to leave, I already knew kind of some of the stuff you were going to go through a little bit because I had gone through it myself. And at first, it was fine. It was fine. And then it hit me. (laughs) You know, you re- you don't you don't realize after being working in the same types of situations for twenty years, you know how what that does to you mentally. You know, right. you, you get so in tune with waking up, dealing with the same BS schedule, the routine. Uh, you know, even though every day is a little bit different, you know, it's still the every, same. Every you, day you, you the deal, same. You're dealing with the same thing, right? Someone not paying the bill. Someone needs, you know, something from you, and then you times that by how many people you have under you, and then you try to be the guy that can even help the other departments out when they can. Well, you love to be the guy that would go in and fix everything. Well, oh, I'm the problem it, solver. It's Everybody not, can. Was, yeah, yes, but it was also like, oh, Sean seems pretty helpful. <laughs> Let's yeah. go to Sean. I right? used to call that uh, taking advantage of you. Yeah. But you no, know, but you know the the, pe- the the people themselves are always going to be drawn to people who can help, True. no matter what it is, right? Yeah. So if you're a good doctor, you have a, you have good patients. You know, you have well, a good patients. Well, I mean, you have a lot of patients. Have, I wouldn't say they were all good. Right. Well, you know what I mean. You have a you know you have yeah. A, it's the same anywhere. It's just right. you know we're we're great in yeah. the restaurant industry. We have great customers. Right. You know, exactly. loyal following. Yeah. You know, people who want who you know come to you. Right. They're drawn. And, you, and you get into the situations where you know every day it's going to be a poop storm. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you're going to get tackled with everyone's problems. And right. upper management who doesn't know how to handle it. Or, you know, doesn't want to handle it anymore right. because they've been doing it for 50 years. Right. Right. And that's and that's not just one, you know, one place they've been. That's every place. Like every place yeah. has upper management. And, you know, middle management is the toughest job in the world. People don't realize that. Right. Like your manager is probably one of many. Right. But those managers have to report to upper management and then yep. upper management has to either report to, you know, a president or a, a president CEO, CEO or, an or owner. the owners of the company. Yeah. Right. And sometimes the middle management is all the management. And especially when you get to like a mom and pop place. Right. Mom and pop are the owners and middle management takes care of everything. Right. And you were middle management. Right. And it's, you know, it's. It gets to the point where, okay, is this what I'm going to do for the rest of my life? Like, I'm going to come to work, 
and work for somebody else and just drag out 10 to 12 hour days. Monotonous every day. You know. I felt the exact same way when I worked. Blasting through, trying to blast through traffic yep. as fast as you can. I well, actually, I actually, I'm the opposite of you because that was the one thing that I didn't mind about going into the office when I did the corporate scene was that I, because I'm a mom and I'm a wife and I'm, you know, I have, you know, all this responsibility that it would be the only time I would actually get to myself was when I was in traffic. Yeah, you would think that, but... In, but my, you, in the H track world, your answer and phone yeah, calls. There's always someone that wants, yeah. hey, how come I haven't got my quote? Or how come someone hasn't sent me my quote? Or why is this person not answering my phone yeah. calls? Or, or why is my bill this much money? Or, or your technician pooped on my seat and didn't wipe. You know, yeah. <laughs> or he wore his. You know, he wore his Nikes instead of his Timberlines on my white rug. And yeah, he didn't, didn't wear those little blue booties that booties. you're supposed to wear when you walk through you the know. house. Or he made eye contact with my dog, and my dog is very sensitive. Yeah. No, I, I just couldn't. I, towards the end, I just I couldn't I couldn't deal with it anymore. <laughs> I just couldn't deal with it. And you know, there was high end residential work, and that was tougher than commercial. You know, it, it takes a special someone to be able to go into someone's sixteen million dollar mansion, and not even know who the homeowner is because they have fifteen people. They have the but, you know, they have their yeah, they have a house manager. They have a house manager. That house manager has to deal with the butler. It's just crazy. Yeah, it's just you know. And then we get to start this, and um, semi in charge, and I'm like, all right. I mean, uh, let's uh, talk about semi in charge. I mean, come on now. <laughs> Um, we were sitting in the, I remember the day we started the LLC. I was like, well, you know, I had already left corporate America. I yeah. had already had my identity crisis. We'll talk about that in a minute because you go through it. I had already felt like I'd been a failure multiple times trying to do what I was doing and, you know, be an author and and start a, and run a business and everything else. And, you know, we signed the LLC and we were like, this is it. This is where we're going. And I said, you know, it, it's your turn now. So we're going to do this thing. And you went from having all kinds of responsibility to just smoking Cooking. meat. No one to look after. Well, I mean, well, you, I mean, you took care of yeah. the employees at that point, right? Well, and we it, weren't, we didn't even really have employees. We, we had minimal employees because we had, you know, vendors and markets and stuff like right. that. So right. I was like, well, wait a minute. What do I do? Well, you did try to micromanage me. Well, yeah, I mean, and that was like a struggle. You're, you're the only person I had to manage. I thought <laughs> you weren't managing me; I was managing you. Yeah. <laughs> so you know, there is this whole thing of okay, what what do I like? Literally, like I just wake up and I cook. I like I don't make any decisions. I don't make. You didn't know what to do with yourself. I had no idea. There, you know, I was making lists of lists to do lists of lists. Yeah. You know. I'm going to make this list about a list that I, a list that I may do or may not do because <laughs> no one's watching me. And you had never worked really with me before and seen, you know, I had already developed a level of self-discipline in my life to be able to work for myself and earn money and, you know, even just being a mom and being home and all of that stuff that you had worked with people who relied on management to get them through the day. And for me, you'd be like, so did you uh, did you yeah. do the catering today? And I'd be like, I seriously, like, what do you think I do all day? Like, well, I'm what... doing the catering. Stop asking me that question. <laughs> did you reach out to this part? Yes. And then, and then yeah. Already like, did that. Why are you badgering stop me? Stop badgering me. I'm like, well, this is, this is what I do. I make sure everyone else is doing their job. You're like, I'm doing my job. I'm doing my job. I was like, you've never worked with somebody who just does their job without so, being asked. Like, that's like, a thing in life. And as we, you know, when we opened up the restaurant, it just got worse. Everything sort of, you know, our lack of sleep. Yeah, fell know, apart. It, it looked like it, it was all going amazing, right? It looked like we were like just like really crushing it. We yeah, were like, hey, us. look at this. Look God at this. God knows what. It no, like to I think else. everybody else saw this like powerhouse couple building a business, doing everything, like working great together, and this and that. And if you weren't really close to us, you didn't see. The craziness. You didn't see what we were going through when no. we were going home, how, you know, the struggle that we had, the inner turmoil. And it, and it wasn't like being miserable at the job. It was me not being able to, like, actually comprehend what was happening. Like, I wasn't getting, like, in the beginning, 
wasn't getting any yeah, sleep. Yeah, and I wasn't either. Yeah. yeah. So it was a it was a headstrong like, well, I'm not sleeping. Well, you're not sleeping. Yeah. Well, you know, I sleep less than you know. I, I, mean, I would get three hours, then have to be at work because we didn't have a bunch of front mm-hmm. of the house people, you know, and then struggling with no sleep and then struggling with like not really having any kind of a f- authority. Right. Like, because it was all. Because it was all you. Yeah. Right. And I was like, well, what? What is seriously? What is going on? And then yeah. I hired more help. That help still, you were running that help, and I was like, "Yeah, what's cool? okay? Don't do that for no reason." I would just tell people, "Hey, stop doing that." Yeah. And then everyone would laugh, and then I would laugh. I'm like, "Why am I telling them not to sharper than knife right now?" Like, yeah, like yeah. This doesn't make any sense. <laughs> And, and then, I mean, and, and no offense, like you, this was your first foray into like the restaurant industry while you'd been in management and you'd run companies and you'd done a lot of things. You'd never worked in the restaurant industry, whereas I had. And for you, it was a whole new world. Yeah. And then I would get less, less and less, like it was just getting, I was just getting deeper into it. Like it started becoming like a dark, really dark hallway. Like, you know, we talk about the the elevator. Yeah, I your think. elevator is my people in my head, yeah. my room in my head. I would get on an elevator, and I would hit every button. But Just the doors wouldn't ride open. Ride it up and down, <laughs> up and down. The doors wouldn't open. So, I, you know, I had yeah. no real solid direct. I knew I had to get, you know, meat off the smoker for to the restaurant to open. And then it couldn't be I wasn't in the restaurant anymore because I couldn't cook. Yeah, so you weren't and a part of, like, the, the scene that we were – experiencing with the customers right. and working during the day and right. we would have all kinds of fun and yeah, you were a part I would, of that. I was missing that part, right? And then I would start just like it was just like tremendous thinking like, oh my God, like I've got I've quit this X amount of paying job to being stuck in a cave by myself. And all the other beers are done hibernating, and I'm still in a cave. Yeah. Like, I don't know what time it is. I don't know what day it is. And on top of that, you know, in order for us to open the restaurant, we had to get investors and put quite a bit of money into a business, money yep. that, you know, we didn't have, money that we did have. And, you know, it was a constant battle. It was a constant weight on your shoulders daily of worrying about every bit of money that you had to pay back to people that you owed vendors, like whose bill was what and so yeah. on and so forth. And, but it was like not somebody else's money we it, had to worry about. Just, it was ours. That's just, that's just the thing, right? Oh, I can't pay this bill this week. It's not my money. Yeah. When you work for somebody else, you can be like, oh, okay, well, we can't pay the bill. It's, it's somebody yeah, else's it's your problem. problem. To figure out what, you know. When it's us, it's like, oh, oh uh, I got that phone call that I can't <laughs> pay, you know, like if I couldn't buy equipment, it was like, okay, so and so, I can't buy this yet because they're saying that the account's not working. Yeah. Oh, okay, I'll, I'll get it fixed. I'll get them a check. Let them know. I'll get them a check. So that was one of the things that I started manage. Well, I, I kind of managed from the beginning. I took over, you know, all aspects of running the business. I sort of just jumped in, you know, as the general manager of the company, and you were going through what you were going through, and. We were going home at night and or well, whatever time of day it was that we were actually crossing paths. It wasn't always night. Right. And, I, you know, you would be uh, cranky. Uh, cranky. And I would be <laughs> I'm trying to be nice here. <laughs> I was mean. You were mean. I was mean. You were going through a period yeah. of like and it, it was unintentional. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And I, I, it was sort of like, you know. All of a sudden, everything was being blamed on me. Like everything was going wrong, and it was my fault that it was going wrong. And if you but didn't like not... something somebody else did, it was my yeah. fault. Or you, you know, and you weren't expressing yourself. But it wasn't that I was yelling at you. I just didn't know how to express it correctly. That I you were very like, passive aggressive. A uh, wicked passive aggressive, right? Yeah. And then not realizing I was doing it until very recently. Well, I mean, well, that's we we've been through a huge journey yeah. in this in this month. You didn't you had no idea. Nope. I would I would be like, why are you being you know why are you yelling? At me? Not you weren't yelling at me. Why are you being so mean? Why are we fighting over this? And your favorite saying was, we're not fighting. I'm not fighting. You're I'm not fighting, fighting at I'm all. Fighting. <laughs> I'd be like, am I fighting with myself? Like, is that how this works? I yeah. thought it took two. Yeah, it um, got ugly. And you know, I could see it in you. And then um, there was one morning. Where I was going into work, you had cooked all night long, and 
you know, I, I headed into work and then I got the phone call from you that you said, I just got off the phone with the VA crisis helpline. Yep. And I had to walk into work. <laughs> yep. Knowing I had a mental breakdown. And like worrying what was going to happen next. Yeah. And manage my team and open the restaurant. Yeah. And leave you at home all by yourself. Yeah. I was fine. Oh, you say that now. You were not fine. <laughs> I was, no, that day I was not fine. But, you know. And leading that, up to that day, you were not fine. No, but that was. One what of the, led you to do that? What led you to finally reach out and get help? It was just, you know, I had, you know, we had two suicides and, you know, some friends, military friends. Um, and I could not attend their wakes right. or funerals um, because they were in different parts of the country. And then one of them, you know, killed himself of suicide for the same reasons. You know, didn't know he was out of the service. He had been out for a while, and he just said he couldn't. He couldn't. Felt like he couldn't go on for whatever reason, right? And then I got I got that phone call from one of my other friends saying so and so as you know we were in the restaurant when that happened and he broke down. Yeah. And I said to myself, I'm not going to let that happen to me. I'm not going to. I've got too much to live for. You know, what we're doing with the restaurant is important. But away from the restaurant, I've got kids. I've got a wife. I've got a family. You know, I've got brothers and sisters. I, how many nieces and nephews do I have that are about to have babies? You know, they're about to have. They've like, all had babies at this point. <laughs> not all of them. <laughs> so, okay. Some of them are Some males. <laughs> They They've had babies with their wives. You know, uh, and really, I, I do enjoy life, you know, and I called the crisis center and got to talk to somebody and realized the stuff that I'm, you know, was so worried about was so, like, short on the on the life danger. Like, it's not that. It's not that bad. It's not that bad. It's not that big of a deal. It's just, it's just new, right? right? And having that military structure in me. It's new things don't right. They don't match, right? It takes years of moving pieces to actually have those pieces fall in line. And whether you spent two years in the military or thirty years in the military, that is one thing that's so ingrained in a military personnel structure, structure and routine. And routine. And you once you get off of routine, your mind and body don't understand why you're not doing that routine and it becomes such a developing yeah, like you have to unlearn that in your right. whole life rewire your brain it's been 24 years since i've been out of the military i think 2000 yeah and you still kind of sometimes you'll you know even around the kids you'll go into like military sean mode and you'll be like it's time to clean up everybody get in line <laughs> you know it, and it's something, and i'm like what what are you doing and like <laughs> and people will say how can, i don't understand how you can still think like that it's like well i guess you have to think like that 24 hours a day right there are no days off there is no you know i'm going to take a weekend because you might have weekend duty right mm-hmm. Well, you might get caught or the Jets might get called in. Whatever it is, it, there is no off time. But there is no off time in our life right now either. However, however, there is no, you know, there is no mission, right? The mission is... There's no life or death mission. Correct. You know, The not, mission is to live life every mistake, and enjoy it. Every, every mistake we make isn't going to cause a plane to go down. Or and that's one of the things pilot. that I had said to you when you first started going through this is that, you know, you would come up with something and it would be like really crazy. Like um, I had to, you know, cook brisket or, you know, I had to wrap the brisket and you would unwrap it later in the day and, you know, talk about how horrible my bark was on the brisket and it was just ruined and destroyed. And well, it there would was be, one that you did. Okay. That looked at that. Yeah. But that I, that was after a couple of drinks late at night and then I had to stop in and do that for you. But whatever. We're not going to talk about that one. Uh but, you know, it was it was like, you know, the end of the world. You were like, yeah. this whole brisket has to get thrown in the trash. And I'm like, that's like $300 right there. You can't just throw that in the trash. You're, you know, freaking out about money, but you want to throw the brisket away. Yeah. Everything was end of the world for you for quite some time. Like, yep. you just thought it was all going to be over. It was going to end every day. Yep. If we had a slow day in the restaurant, it was the end of the world. We were never going to see any customers ever again. And yep. 
I just don't enjoy that level of negativity in my life. No, you're just the opposite. You, know, I, you need positivity. And I, I look for the positive yeah. in every. I'm not all lollipops and rainbows. I know everything isn't perfect. No. And one of the ways I was able to really understand what you were going through is because I had been through my own mental health crisis. Yeah. And I think everybody goes through it, you know, one level or another. Mine was like a roller coaster up and a straight line down. And then that's when I said, oh, Jesus, this is crazy. Well, you're not one to express your emotions. No, I'm Irish. And and you're a man. Yeah. I'm sorry. Sorry, guys. But, you know. (laughs) We definitely don't talk. Um, Um, Well, you didn't for a while, but that's changed. No, I'm telling you that for any military vet that has these same feelings, call the crisis center. It's telling you, the, the person on the other end knows nothing of what you're going through which is actually helpful. And we're going to give you the number at the end of this episode because if you feel like right now you understand what we're talking about, then we want you to make sure that you reach out and get some help. Yeah, or come to the restaurant and talk to me. There you go. I have a dumpster and I can put seats out there. Yeah. You know, don't... don't Get it off your chest. Get it off your chest. Yeah, keeping it bottled up inside. Doesn't work. We have this new thing. I'm I'm a venter when I get... I'm uh, as an... As an author, as a writer, as a, you know, a communication person, I, this is the thing I love to do, talking and podcasting and, you know, everything. I've done, you know, public speaking and presentations. Yep. And I'm, as soon as I, I feel like. I public speaking. <laughs> as soon as I feel like something's bothering me, I'm literally like, hey, man, yeah. something's bothering me and I'm going to tell you about it. And one of the things that you would always try to do was resolve that problem immediately because you were the fixer, right? You were the problem solver. We talked about that in the beginning. Yeah. And then I would get more frustrated with you. And, you know, when you're going through your own mental health crisis and you're in a bad way and I'm trying to vent to you and now I can't vent to you and you're trying to fix my problems and we're just getting frustrated back and forth, we kind of, we, we learn to adopt the, um, and this, this took a lot of time. We're not talking overnight here. We've been going through this for well over a year together. But we learned to adopt the, do you want to be heard, helped, or hugged? Yep. I generally only ever want to be heard. No. I don't want you to help me, and please don't hug me. Yeah, please I don't. Do not like, no, no touching. I don't like to be hugged. <laughs> you have to warn me before you hug me. Yep. Don't come up and touch me randomly. I'm just not one of those people. No. But that's a that's an important thing that if you're not you know you need to express what you're feeling rather than keep it inside and then just come out with you know all these angry emotions. And, and that's why those line those crisis lines are so good, whether it's through the vet or whatever. Right. They any tell you to any call. crisis line. Because those people have no idea what you you know what your problem is. They're just there to listen, and they're not going to say, "Hey, these are the six things that you need to do." And so you get way deep into therapy. Therapy, but right? there's no there's no judgment. None. They're not there to like make you feel bad. They're not there to tell you how you're going to solve your problems. They just they're going to get you through the phone call, so you can get to the next phone call. That, and and that's, then the next yeah. phone call turns into two, and then then those turn into four, mm-hmm. and then then it was like by the like the not, I think it was like the tenth one is when I was like, wow. I was really messed up. Like, how do I get that bad that quickly? And then you realize, oh, guess what? You've been that bad for more a, than just for a long time. For a long time, and I just was high. I was able to hide it because I had a full time job. I had, you know, you and the kids, my family, and I never really dealt with a lot of different things. And then, you know, having my father pass a few years ago, and not, you know, dealing with certain aspects of his death and my childhood and, yep. you know, it's and nothing nothing horrible. But, you know, just like every person's family life is not always perfect, right? And then we lost my brother-in-law. I, it was just, it got too much too fast. Yeah, there was a there lot. Was a lot that... of new things happening. Not me adjusting very, you know, adjusting fast enough to, you know, process the stuff and it just all hit me at once. And that's the thing, when you work for somebody else, you can take time off. You can take mental health days. You can go. Well, yeah. Fa- well, for the most part, you don't have to sit there and worry about, you know, the company falling apart or failing. No, you just, well, you just but go home. you had to go through this and still wake up every day because who was going to make the brisket? No one. You know? Well, I mean, I could have tried. I'm not saying oh, they would have. That's happened. 
it, they, it, it did happen. I, I, I made it. No one knew. No one knew. No one knew. Everybody was nice enough to tell me no one knew. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but you still got to get up and do it every day. You do. And, that's, and that, that actually was helpful because I got time alone at night. And I still get, you know, I still am the only one in the restaurant from... Which yeah. is amazing. He's all like, oh, I'm alone all by myself, stuck in a cave. And I'm over here like, damn it, when can I be alone, <laughs> stuck in a cave? But I learned, I, over the last, like, month and a half, I've learned to use that time for other things, too, right? To calm my brain down, really judge what I need to do, what I don't need to do. So let's backtrack here for a second because it sounds like, you know, we just kind of like, oh, you had a mental health crisis and we got through it and it's all set. But we did. you didn't. And the same thing that happened with me long before we even started this restaurant <coughs> was one day I plummeted and I fell apart. And I remember yep. saying to you, I don't know how to handle this. I don't know how to fix this. And I had to call my doctor. Yep. And everybody has a different way of figuring out how to heal their mental health. And I went through what I went through for quite a few years, figuring that out. And then when you went through it, you know, it, you're saying over the last month, but it's been a, a whole year. Oh, yeah. Since oh. you've called the VA Crisis Healthline. Yeah. It's, but it's just over the last month that you've been able to really come together with the things that well, you've been I, figuring I, I've out been and able learning. To, like, retrospect everything that happened in the past. Because yes. I've got a much better head, you know, head, I'm in a much better headspace than I was even three months ago. Yeah. Right? Having my shoe Absolutely. untied isn't the worst thing ever. Right. Right. Or having the kids draw them on the walls or it was just everything compounded together. Every little issue, you know, it was just it was just too much. And you were in a lot of denial about things, you know. Well, every... that's a, and I think everyone that goes through that. Yeah. You know, that's not me. That's not me. And, let, you know, let's be honest. I never thought about suicide. That was never, you know, something that was ever in my head. Um but, you know, I can see where people, you know, say, I, this is it. I, I can't do this anymore. And There's no light at the end no of the tunnel. There's no light the tunnel. And I'm telling you that there is. You know, there's always light at the end of the tunnel. There's it may, always a it way It may be through. dim at the end of the tunnel, but at the end of the day. And maybe you can't see the end of the tunnel, but you don't really need to. Just get to the next light. Yeah. You know, follow the road until there's the, another set of lights. That's it. Whether they're coming at you on the other side of the road or they're coming from, you know, the telephone pole, there's always going to be a light, you know, and you just got to take the steps to get there. And then when you get there, you worry about the next set of lights. And the steps are different for everybody, yep. you know, and a lot of it helps if you can find some kind of purpose yeah, for yeah. something. And I think even God if that's somebody that, that loves you. I don't have an addictive personality with, like, alcohol. Like, I don't have any dependencies. I do. Right? I definitely have an addictive personality. Yeah. But not in a, I, I think not in a, like, I think because of your family. Well, it's you know? a, I, I think, you it's know, in my family brought, history. Yeah. It's in my blood. And it wasn't it's very too, easy for me. You know, and but for some reason I was able to not have that issue. I could not imagine going through, I was going through over the last year and a half being addicted to pills or being addicted to alcohol or some kind of narcotic. That makes it so would, much worse. It makes it so much worse, right? And if you know, you know, you've got those dependencies and you're not in a good headspace, you got to get some help because you can't, also, you're not going to be able to do it by yourself. One of the things that I think a lot of people don't understand when they're going through stuff like this is that it's not your fault. No. Like, if, you, if you went out bike riding and you fell and you broke your arm, right, you would go to the doctor and you would get your arm fixed. You wouldn't just walk around with a broken arm for the rest of your life pretending it wasn't broken. Or forget you, that it was broken. Or forget that it was. It would, it would freaking hurt. Like yeah. you, would, you would go get it fixed. But when we find that our brains are falling apart and breaking, we just want to ignore it and pretend it's not true. And yeah, because like you, tomorrow's going to be better. And then you wake up and tomorrow's not better. It's actually a little bit worse because you're carrying over all the crap you were carrying over from the day before. Because not nothing's, it nothing's go. resolved. Right. And the, cri the crisis center that I was calling, you know, they give you, a, you know, what, once you get through that hot crisis call and they set you up with, you know, regular appointments and stuff like that. And, yeah. You know, um, 
that's when you realize, okay, you know, here's the here's that second light, you know, I'm talking, a, you know, second third time, and then you get past those lights, and now you're you know you're kind of in an open space where, you know, they're giving you the kind of tools to try to figure things out, and then and you'll have a lot of ups and downs along the way. It'll yeah. feel like a lot of times it'll feel like you're backtracking. Yeah. When you're going through that. Yeah, I, I think I knew, like, after the first couple of months where my humor started coming back. Oh, yeah, that that had been gone for quite some time. You know, I was the funny guy again, you know, and I wasn't miserable at every little thing. Like, right. kind of my coffee spilling. or You didn't notice how, actually, I think for you, one of the first times you noticed that you hadn't been, you know, jovial in such a long time was when we did the first podcast and we sat down in this room and we laughed about something and I caught myself laughing on camera and you said to me it's nice to hear you laughing again yeah and I said to you well it's nice to have you make me laugh again yeah right yeah and then you know that's where we are here we are today (laughs) right where it's been a lot of behind the scenes you know you know, every day we're waking up and we're running the restaurant and we're going in and we're doing things. And, um, you know, I want to I want I do want to talk about the elevator. Right. Um, because I had when I had asked you, you know, what was going on, you said, I, f- I feel like I'm on an elevator and it, it's just going up and down and it just won't stop. And that clicked for me because I had already long been on my own mental health healing journey and doing a lot of things because for my whole life, I had been diagnosed with, um, you know, panic disorder, anxiety disorder, OCD, PMDD, and all the other things that you can think of that would make, yeah, (laughs) that would make you seem crazy, right? All the time. And through my healing on my own mental health journey, I had healed myself out of these, some of these disorders that were driving me and you crazy. And um, I had said to you, wait, let's stop there for a second, because your elevator is the room in my head. So the room in my head, when I was at my lowest point, was really just a person in my mind that was very angry and wild. And when I When I went on my healing journey, I had started creating space in my head to talk to myself and to the parts of myself that were hurting the most. Yeah, that's just crazy. Yeah. (laughs) You say that. That's crazy. You say that. But, you know, so it started off with that one angry version of myself. And then, you know, there there came another. There was an anxiety version. There was a, you know, a nervous one, an introverted person. I, I even had a um, hungry version of myself. And there's a writer in there. And I created this space in my mind using my imagination so that I could talk to myself to figure out how to fix that. And I had said to you, well, your elevator is my room in my head. Right. And you have to stop. You have to push a button and no, stop on that, one floor. And that was the problem. I had pushed every button. No, you have to stop. Yeah, no, you right. have to get off on one floor. Right. And, and you know, and that's, that's an analogy we come back to very often when we have conversations. Yeah. Got to get off. Got to get off the floor. Maybe it would not be the right floor. Maybe you just let the doors open for a minute. Like, yeah. so whether you have a room in your head or an elevator or you med- however you meditate or however you think about things, if yep. you need to stop for a minute, you just open the doors and peek, it, peek outside and see what's going on. Yeah. And then get back in. Yeah. That's a step in the right direction. Maybe you're at a zoo. Yeah, maybe it's full of animals. You, you never know. I mean, take the time to, <laughs> yeah. to figure it all out. There might be a zebra there. <laughs> so one of the things that does happen when we're going through all of this is I started to burn out. I was like really overworking myself and really burning out. And you were already in a burnout phase. I was already burnt out. And and mentally, not physically. And we weren't like, yeah, mentally, physically, emotionally, the whole shebang. Yeah. Yeah. Physically. Well, yeah. I mean, physically, I wasn't outside of my autoimmune disease. I wasn't. Yeah. I was physically fine, but mentally and emotionally, I was exhausted and I was just not doing well. 
I, I you know, it was like just trying to, and it was, I found myself just trying to go through the motions every day. Right. And then I had to be there for the kids. And yep. then, I don't know, how did we come out of that? How, how did we, we just, start? One step at a time, we just started like, I think that both of us started learning how to work together again. We started comprehending, you know, comprehending each other, each other over, you know, realizing yeah. that we're both struggling and then trying to figure out how we can help each other, un- you know, kind of untangle some things. Having a level of like mutual consideration for yeah. what we and have to go through. Leaning on some of our coworkers to kind of pick up where we're kind of falling down, right? And just, then, yeah, giving them, the, you know, the space that they needed to, to grow in the company, you know, because they, they, they already knew how to do the job. They just needed the yeah, and trusting in the fact that they could do the job that we didn't have to be there making sure it was getting right, done right, and uh, you know, just thank God that we had the right people in the right spots, yeah, right, um, business partner wise, and you know, back of the house, front of the house help, yeah, and then you and I were able to figure some things out on personally, you know, through marriage and all that stuff, and we just said, you know. These little things that are compounding are just stupid. Like, is it worth getting in the way of our marriage yeah. and, you know, having us fall apart? Yeah. You, we've been together for 20 years. It's crazy. I know, isn't it? Yikes. Yeah. So, and, you know, are we going to last another 20 years or yeah. is this business going to break us? Because a lot of people get into business together and get divorced. Right. And we, we, didn't, we didn't want that to happen. We don't want that to happen. Right. We had to figure out how to get it. And it's... The easiest things to do is just figure out work and life schedule, right? Right. You need to be here. You need to be this at home at, to help with the kids so the kids don't feel like there's no parents at home. But you also needed to be able to spend some time with them as well. Yeah. And I think that the schedule that we have now is what's right. help, most helpful for our home and life yeah. and and in business. Yeah. You know? You know, we get to work together on Saturdays, and we know that we only need one day a week yeah, to that work we, together, <laughs> right? We um, love each other, but, uh, you know, we yeah. need a little less time together now. Um, you know, my schedule has changed for the better for the first, you know, it's even three hours. Well, because we had talked about, you know, trying to shift so that you were coming home earlier in the morning to get right. to sleep so you could get in. And you could and then spend some time actually in the restaurant seeing customers. Right, and, which I love. Being a part, which was one of the reasons why we started this in the first place. Right. And then we just started adapting different stuff and taking some pressure off of Connor um, so, he Con- could, yep. yeah, so he could be an 18 year old. Wait, he's not 18 yet. Don't push it. Yeah, September. So he was enough. definitely feeling like he yeah. was having to be responsible for a lot of stuff that yeah. he shouldn't have no, felt right. that. And then, and then there, here we are today. You know? Right. And in episode two, we when we had discussed the episode Living Our Dream, I had mentioned unlearning the hustle. And that's one of the things that, um, I, you know, in today's society, everybody's all about the hustle. And it's like, well, you know, I'm going to come home and shut down at the end of the night. And that, you know, for you, that's coming home at, you know, four or five o'clock in the morning and not, you know, doing social media or checking emails or you just come home and you shut down now. And you go to sleep, and then when you get up, you get a little bit of time with our youngest. And yep. then, you know, you get to come home later in the evening and get some time with the other two. And yep. Sundays are our family days where we, you know, even if we just go to the park or I get hit with the wiffle ball in the face outside of my backyard. It's, folks, that's only happened once. <laughs> it still hurts. Marsha Brady. It still hurts. Happened once. Um, you know, um, and making sure we have time for friends and for family because a lot of, you know, a lot of the burnout I was experiencing was overworking myself and, you know, not even getting to talk to my friends. Right. You know? Yep. And that, you know, and I mean, I'm not sure if you have any friends that you want to talk to, but <laughs> friends are important. Yeah. In the last know? couple of weeks, we've seen a lot of my military buddies coming in. Yes, Which and it's nice when everybody comes in to visit, for sure. Really, really cool. You get to get, you know, back in touch with some people and, yep. you know, um, just kind of get back to who you are as a person. Because when you first started going through all this, I remember saying to you, like, this is not... Not worth I, it. I, no, I said, I don't know you. This is not the man that... Yeah. 
No, that defi- I met. definitely, and then I think that's when you know a lot of things had to kick in, and you know I really had to address some things, and you know we've been addressing these things now for quite some time, where I'm at a point where I can, you know, finally say that I've got a clear, I got a much clearer head. There yep. are day, there are days that aren't you know so great, and there are some days that I don't think about it at all. Right. That's that's I think that's natural. I mean, again, I've been going through it for much longer than you. And I still have my moments where I'm very, you know, I'm cranky and I'm not in a good headspace. And it's like, you know, one of the things that I'll say and I'm able to say to people now is like, okay, I'm in a bad mood and it's not your fault. It has nothing to do with you. You have to be able to say, listen, it's not your fault. Today sucks. Like, I'm just feeling it today. Yep, I woke up on the wrong side. I woke up <laughs> on the wrong side. On the wrong side of the bed. I ch- I chose hate today. Yeah. <laughs> for no reason. But I got I'm carrying get, a dagger with me everywhere I, gotta I go. I got to get a cup of coffee. I got to take two hours to figure out why. Like all I wanted to do was lie in bed. I didn't want to get up at five a.m. and yeah, exercise. Right. At five a.m. and exercise. Um, <laughs> uh, you, uh, so you know, and it's just realizing, hey, not every day is going to be the best day of your life, and. You got to find, yeah, it's like, you know, there's this thing in society where we all have to strive for like constant happiness and joy. And it's like, that's, you know, you just got to find calm and peace and and joy in little things throughout the day. Not every moment is going to be perfect. I've said this to a lot of people. Life is like, like a box uh, of chocolates. No, please. Oh, wait, can I say that? Can I say that? (laughs) Life is exactly like the, the Muppet show. (laughs) <laughs> if you really think about it. Yes. Starts off crazy. Kermit tries to get things figured out by mid-show. And I'm Kermit. Yeah. And then things start to level off, and then they have a great show, even it, though they thought it was going to be horrible. It, yeah. And then credits roll. And then you look back on hindsight, and you're like, look at it. You know, we thought it was going to be all horrible, but yeah. look at how great it was. Yeah. That's sort of my mentality. Like, I always say... You know, you got to look for the positive in every day. And maybe you had, like, a terrible day, but this wonderful thing happened. Like, you know. I'm telling you right now, I've got the, the two people in my head are the two old Muppets, Scott Lauren rolled off. <laughs> you know, I, if you folks don't know, I love the Muppets. I yeah, I mean, I think we've talked about it in every episode so far. <laughs> um, but that's, I mean, that's that's it. I'm making fun of everybody because that's what makes me laugh. And Oh, that's great. <laughs> that's great. Um, and it's just, you know. Life is different, and, and, and it's okay. But if you're out there and you need help, and you think you need help, even if you think you need it, that means you need if it. If you know someone who needs it, yeah, like make the phone call. You know, they're not gonna they're not gonna like that you made the phone call for them, but when they do and they start talking, they'll thank you for it. And if you th- you're never too far gone. And one of the things that, um, well, you love the Muppets, but one of my favorite um, people in the world, the famous world right now, is Mel Robbins. I listen to her faithfully. You do. And she recently, or recently, I have no idea when, but one of her podcasts was all about, you know, happiness. And this um, this medical doctor, Dr. Um, Robert Waldinger, he's a professor at Harvard Medical School, and he ran an 86-year-long study um, at Harvard called, well, he's the director of it now. I don't know if he was there when it first started, but it's called the Harvard Study of Adult Development. And the study, in the whole study, they basically found that the way for you, the the best way for you to have a great life and a happy life is to have great relationships, great long-lasting relationships. And one of the things that we do when we're sad and miserable is push people away. (laughs) And that's the time when you're not supposed to do that. <laughs> no. And the people who lived the longest, healthiest, happy lives had developed great. And it's not just husband and wife or partners. It's friendships. It's parents and children. It's great relationships in your life. It's knowing you have someone you can call. Yes. So you should totally listen to that Mel Robbins episode. I don't know what the name of it is. I can uh, link I'm it sure after. I'm sure you'll find it and, and text it you know, to me share at 9 p.m. It. <laughs> Right when I'm about to go into But work. it's one of my favorite episodes, and, um, it you know, it's just making sure that you have that time. You know, don't isolate yourself. So this this was a, a great episode, I think, right? I think a lot of people out there struggle. 
Yes. Um, but I want to end this on a really good note. So. So I want to talk about the moink for five minutes. Five minutes. Five minutes. For the last five so, minutes. So, folks, this is how you stay motivated every day by talking about the moink. So the moink. Erica, why don't you tell people what the moink is? Why? <laughs> Sean has this thing where he wakes up from his, you know, sleep in the middle of the afternoon, which is his morning, and he comes in and he's starving. He's like, roar, I need to eat food right now, and I don't want just meat. And he comes up with all these different ideas, so... The last sandwich that you made was the moink. It was a brisket and pulled pork so you gotta, with Alabama white. You got to take the two rolls, the the the, the roll, the brioche you gotta, buns. You got to separate it. You got to put a red barbecue sauce on one. Oh, you did red sauce too. Red sauce on one and Alabama white on the other, and then on the red side you put one piece of fatty brisket, and the other side you put pulled pork. And then you smush it. And then you put a piece of American cheese in between it, and then oh, you put see. it together, and you get... The moink. You get a piece of moo and a piece of oink. <laughs> so you get moink. It's called the moink. <laughs> I love it. It was delicious. However, you need to be a T-Rex to get your mouth around the, uh, the sandwich, but you got to squish it. Uh, clearly not something I would eat. No, but I guarantee you... We're gonna put on. We're gonna put it on our special board this it's, week. It's actually already on the menu. I guarantee you, it sells. Because you posted it, and then I went and posted it, and then I had to go delete the post because you had already posted it. And that's the one thing we really do have to do better at. What? Telling each other when what we're, we're post. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Communicate, Sean, please. When you um, post on yeah, social it's media, it's always my fault. <laughs> I have a great idea, and I post it, and then 10 seconds later, you have that same great idea. Oh, that sounds great. I'm going to post on TikTok. I mean, you know, it is important to let the social media manager know. I'm the social media manager. That's what you're doing, yeah. right? Well, well, this is a great episode. You know, I think... Uh, you're totally ending this really fast. It's cut and run time. Cut Get run me time. out of here I'm so tired. I don't cry. I am tired. There's no crying in podcasting. <laughs> I may have shed a tear or two. You did. You totally held back. No, I did. Uh, so, right. yeah, we're going to end this episode. Um, you know, we spent a lot of time, you know, over the last year really learning from our mistakes and figuring things out and, you know, communicating with each other and learning how to work together. And it's been a big journey. Um, and we have a lot more coming. So we're really excited. To, yeah. We're you know, episode what number? We're on episode four. Four. And I honestly think that this doing this podcast together has brought us together in closer in ways that we weren't before. And it's it's been like part of our healing journey, part of our A hundred percent. That's of, why I said in the beginning this will help us. Yeah. Figure talk. things out and yeah. <laughs> Speak in the same room. <laughs> now I won't talk to him for two days because yeah, he's too tired. I was tired. just gonna say <laughs> <laughs> I've talked to you enough. Woo! Tired going home. I could All use some right. time alone. All well, right, we're gonna go home and make some dinner for the kids and get ready for the you work know week. for life and the week and everybody stay safe and you know call take somebody. care of yourself. Call somebody and we're going to give you that VA crisis helpline number right at the end of this episode. So thank you so much for listening. Thank you, WCTV, for having us here and producing this podcast. Yep. And we will see you in the next episode. That's right. Episode five. Dun, dun, dun. I feel like we're in Star Wars. Okay. Stay tuned in episode five. I'm a Trekkie. You, we should shut this off now then. <laughs> <laughs> if you need help, please call the Crisis Helpline. Dial 988 from your cell phone. If you're a veteran, you can press 1. You can also text 838-255. Please reach out if you need help. Thank you.